Osama Hakani, age 13, August 21st, 2012. Wahid Ullah, age 12, October 31st, 2011. Sanaullah Jan, age 16, November 26, 2010. According to CNN on the day of his death, Sanaullah Jan was driving with two of his friends from school, where he was studying to be a doctor, when his car was targeted by an American drone strike. Although military officials refused to speak, local sources say his body was so horridly scarred that his ID card was the only way to identify him. These victims and hundreds more have been highlighted by the Naming the Dead Project, a special website launched on September 23, 2013 by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism with the goal of challenging the U.S. government's denial of responsibility for CIA drone strikes in Pakistan, states the Huffington Post of September 23, 2013. With the commemoration of over 2,500 victims in a public space, the project has gained international attention. According to Wire magazine of February 5, 2013, this project is giving voice to a community that has been silenced since the launch of the drone program in 2004. Therefore, it is important to ask the research question. How can naming the dead alter public perception <coughs> of America's use of drones? To answer, we will turn to the AIDS Memorial Quilt, a contemporary culture of public commemoration by Carol Blair and Neil Michael, published in Rhetoric and Public Affairs of 2007. The authors explain how the AIDS Quilt Project radicalized the rhetorical strategies of public commemorations and how these strategies can motivate change. Therefore, it is fitting for our analysis. So first, let's analyze Blair and Michael's model. Apply it to naming the dead before finally drawing critical implications to a project that the Guardian of September 21st, 2013 states could contest the facts the U.S. government is relaying to the public. Blair and Michael analyzed the AIDS Quilt Project as a revolution to classic commemorative campaigns, specifically in comparison to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, revealing three tenets. Democratic representation, blurring invention and reception, and balancing the public and private spheres. First, democratic representation. Blair and Michael recall that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial took a new stance when presenting all of the fallen soldiers' names with equal weight. No titles or awards were included. The AIDS Quilt Project took this approach and gave each name individuality. The individual details added to the quilts allowed for each name to still carry equal weight, without deviating from the democratic representation that allowed Americans to digest these countercultural commemorations. Next. Blurring invention and reception. The authors explain that a successful commemorative campaign must blur the concepts of invention and reception, creating a rhetoric that is never fully complete. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial allows survivors to add messages to the wall, and the AIDS Quilt Project has been ongoing since 1987. By never fully completing the rhetoric of these campaigns, they blur the lines between their start and end, or their invention and reception. Last, balancing public and private spheres. Unlike the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which balances the public and private spheres of the commemoration almost equally, the AIDS Quilt Project focuses heavily on the private sphere, showing audience members the relationships victims shared before their death. This identification of human relationships brings what are typically private moments into the public sphere, creating a space for victims to begin healing as well as depoliticizing the issue. After analyzing Blair and Michael's model, we can now apply it to naming the dead. So first, democratic representation. Naming the dead identifies each individual with their name, gender, age, date of death, and whether they were a civilian or reported militant, states the Bureau of Investigative Journalism Naming the Dead website, last accessed February 4, 2014. Naming the dead journalists collect the stories of those attacked, giving each name equal weight, 
while maintaining democratic representation. Next, blurring invention and reception. With the ongoing investigation of victims ranging from the start of the drone program in 2004 to the current and end pending strikes, naming the dead creates a rhetoric that is never fully complete. The rhetoric of the campaign depends on stories told by local villagers, and thus the start of the project, or its invention, and end, or reception, are blurred. Last, balancing public and private spheres. Much like the AIDS quilt project, the public and private spheres are balanced, forcing audience members to consider both the individual names on the list and the U.S. foreign policies responsible for the strikes. <coughs> the project also focuses heavily on the private sphere, showing audience members the relationships the victim shared before their death. This private sphere focus creates a space for victims to get, begin healing, as well as depoliticizing the issue. After analyzing Blair and Michael's model and applying it to Naming the Dead, we can now answer our research question. How can Naming the Dead alter public perception of America's use of drones? By following the model of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and the AIDS Quilt Project, Naming the Dead is able to reach the American public in a digestible way. Naming the Dead brings an issue very controversial in the eyes of the audience to the forefront by using a humanizing approach, depoliticizing the actions of the American government, and shedding light on the unfortunate truth shrouding the issue. The rhetorical strategies of the project brings us to two implications for the future of commemorative action, genocide versus insurgency and the rhetorical divide between the Western world and the Middle East. First, naming the dead may have the potential to surpass the tenets laid out by Blair and Michael. According to the Politics of Naming, Genocide, Civil War, and Insurgency, published in the London Review of Books on March 8, 2007, the true success of a commemorative action campaign comes in the audience's rhetorical shift in naming, from insurgency to genocide. The Darfur genocide was labeled as such because there was a clear victim and attacker. Conversely, the Iraq war was labeled insurgency because of the confusing political history surrounding the issue. Naming the dead may clear up the confusion surrounding Pakistani drone strikes, bringing into focus a clear victim and attacker, allowing for a modified label attached to the action. Next, although naming the dead meets all of Blair and Michael's tenets, there is still a large possibility that the project will fail. According to Truth at War and Naming the Intolerable in Palestine, published in Antipode of September 2004, Palestine has failed in projecting their narrative to the international community, largely because of the communication gap between the Western world and the Middle East. Author Ghazi Walid Fala argues that there is a dominant American perception that Arab peoples and nations only respond to force and power. Thus, naming the dead may hit similar roadblocks. Americans' perceptions of Pakistan as a Muslim nation may inhibit naming the dead's success. After analyzing Blair and Michael's model, applying it to naming the dead and drawing critical implications, it is clear that naming the dead is truly revolutionizing the way commemorative action reaches an international audience. And although victims like Sana Ulajan may never have the power to fight for their own cause, the uncovered truth may just be the catalyst in changing American foreign policy.